Well, welcome everybody. Hope everybody's having a, a good day and uh, welcome Dr. Yanka. Really uh, so happy that you're here with us today. Um, Dr. Igor Gallinker is a professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai uh, at Israel um, in New York City. He's the associate chairman of research in the Department of Psychiatry and um, has been a, a, a researcher and clinician for uh, many years. His interests um, span behavioral addictions, uh, a, a good body of work on bipolar disorder, as well as the role of family in psychiatric illness. So he's, um, but, but also the a real major emphasis in suicide prevention. And uh, to provide a little bit of context for why I thought, you know, but we wanted to invite uh, Dr. Gallinker and uh, we know that there's a, um, we have both, you know, researchers and clinicians that are present and to provide a, a little bit of context on why some of the work that he'll be sharing with you today uh, is important. He'll be talking about not who, but when assessing imminent suicide risk in high risk individuals denying suicide ideation. And uh, just to put a kind of a fine point on that, uh, this is really, uh, um, you know, we really have not, so many decisions in psychiatry are made based on asking people uh, about their suicide ideation. Um, and we really haven't advanced from that in a, in, a, in a long time, even though we know that people's reports are not always reliable um, because we have uh, certain people who will tell you direct out, I wanna kill myself. Other people, if you screen them, will say, yeah, I have these thoughts, you know, if you, if you directly ask, but there's a whole group of people and this we don't know very well how to handle who maybe are thinking about it, but aren't gonna tell us, or they're just, they're generally um, ha have what, what Dr. Gallinker will, will share as a constellation of, um, of symptoms that actually um, indicate quite a bit of risk, even though they're not necessarily uh, reporting it. So this is very relevant, um, important uh, research for the field, but also very clinically applicable uh, for, for, for all of us um, in, in our day-to-day -day work. So Dr. Gallagher, thank you uh, again for, for coming. And um, if, you, if everybody, if you would use the Q&A button to ask questions, not the chat, um, as usual. And then we'll, um, we'll take those questions. Dr. Gallagher will take those questions at the end. So uh, take it away, Gary. Thank, thanks so much. Well, thank you uh, so much for kind introduction, uh, Tony. And it's uh, uh, really a pleasure to be here, uh, uh, particularly uh, because uh, you have such incredible uh, suicide prevention program and tradition. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, will add to it or interact with it in a way uh, that uh, not only will help, not only will help in your clinical work, but maybe inform in some way uh, some of the research uh, work that you're doing. So with this, I'll attempt to share my screen. Um, okay, I hope that works. Um, so unless somebody says otherwise, I'll-, I'll we, we, Yeah, we can see it fine. Okay, great. So um, I'll be talking about assessing imminent suicide risk and high-risk individual denying suicidal ideation in the tent. And that would involve a question of both who uh, and when. Uh, so, but before we start, um, let me uh, just uh, share with you that I have no disclosures, uh, except for that my work was supported by American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and NIMH. And I'm on no uh, bureaus, and so I don't have any uh, conflicts. And of course, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, 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 you know, three, uh, work of not only of me by others in my lab now, and previously, and uh, uh, they're listed here, and uh, they range from professors like Lisa Cohen uh, to volunteers and actually residents and staff at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, as you would see, who contributed to this not only. Uh, by uh, being uh, researchers, but also being uh, participants uh, in uh, a great deal of uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about. So um, 
scope of the public health issue. Um, this slide is here, um, among other things, to remind me how long I've been working in suicide prevention and giving this talk. And it started in 2010, actually started 2008. Uh, at that point, there were 38,000 suicides uh, in the United States. Um, suicide rates have been rising yearly uh, since 2000, actually 1999. Uh, uh, until the first decrease when the odds of pandemic, uh, uh, it's, it's been a dip, uh, but uh, uh, not unexpected actually, uh, at least at this time. 197, uh, 2017 was a remarkable year where in one year, 10% rise in suicides in 10 to 24 year olds and 50% of suicides in children. Um, Despite the decrease in 2019 and 2020 overall, there was a dramatic increase in suicide rates in uh, young girls, teenagers, uh, and young adults, and specifically African-American youth. And uh, uh, for the first time, I think uh, the rate of uh, suicides in adolescent females increased that uh, active set of males. So, um, which is a separate uh, kind of story why this is happening. So in terms of who and when, uh, we can break uh, uh, down the suicide prevention into two components. One is to identify people who are at high risk. This is who at some point uh, may, uh, uh, may attempt suicide or die by suicide. And we would think that typically we know who, because these are the people who we see in our emergency rooms. 90% uh, of individuals with a, a mental health disorder or past suicide attempts. Each of them increases the odds ratio for lifetime uh, uh, suicidal behavior, suicide 30 fold. However, 50% of people who die by suicides in a retrospective study do not have a diagnosis of mental illness and did not see any of it. So even that we miss 50%. Then uh, when among these high risk patients that we do see 50%, uh, when those sometimes chronically suicidal people who uh, may attempt to die by suicide. And uh, no high-risk classification currently is useful to identify them. And 70%, 75% of people who die by suicide deny explicitly suicide radiation at their last, uh, last communication with anybody, and specifically with, uh, with clinicians. So with whatever war, uh, uh, when we uh, kind of set out to do our work on suicide prevention, there was a key um, decision that we made at the very outset. And it is whatever we're going to do, we're not gonna rely on suicide radiation. Um, uh, if you think about it, before I go to the slide of my personal record with people uh, uh, who uh, treating suicidal people, just think about it. Uh, would you ever uh, rely uh, on a patient with schizophrenia to diagnose their own schizophrenia? Would you ever rely on a patient with bipolar disorder to diagnose their own bipolar disorder? Now, both of these conditions are less lethal potentially than a pre-suicidal or suicidal mental state. And yet we rely on a person in suicidal mental state to truthfully tell you whether they are or not suicidal when their chances are of killing themselves. So, uh, and yet this is uh, fairly absurd what I'm saying right now, and yet that's the way we've been operating for a very long time. So um, this is my personal big picture in that I've seen and treated 32,000 people by now, probably 34,000 people in my life, 10,000 of them were suicidal. And um, of those three died by suicide uh, in my, um, well, in my care and nine died by suicide within a month of leaving my care for whatever reason. And uh, they, I remember each of them vividly and uh, uh, exquisitely, I would almost say, and I remember what they said and what I said and how I felt the last time I saw them. And uh, there is a, uh, several things, if you think about it systematically, uh, that are important about that interaction. First, that uh, none of these 12 people uh, uh, told me that they were suicidal. They explicitly denied being suicidal, otherwise I would have hospitalized. Second is that in retrospect, I had uh, a feeling, quote unquote, that something wasn't right 
uh, and I was an, uneasy in that last interaction. And yet uh, I wasn't able to identify uh, or quantify or qualify or about uh, do anything about that feeling. And the third uh, is that, uh, again, uh, that there was a disconnect between me and the patient because they didn't tell me they were suicidal and I didn't tell them how uncomfortable I was and something was not right. So in setting up uh, uh, the uh, suicide prevention uh, project that we started now 13 years ago, this is how we formulated our framework. So in predicting imminent suicidal behavior, we need to identify it and understand both acutely suicidal patients and their clinician states of mind. And uh, uh, there was, at the time, there was no framework actually uh, of syndromic medical framework to assess uh, the suicidal mental state. There was no syndrome. So we needed to understand what that syndrome was, what's in suicidal patients. Mind. The second is that uh, there was repeatedly uh, uh, not only anecdotal, but uh, experimental evidence of what we've done that people, clinicians in their last interactions with suicidal patients felt something and sensed something that they didn't sense otherwise, and that needed to be identified. And the last thing that needed to be able to bring these two together uh, uh, to uh, maximize our uh, attempt on preventing suicide and uh, uh, kind of maximize our information. So that was the relationship between the two and how to bring it together. So the way my talk is going to be organized, I'm going to start with the suicidal patients, then I'll briefly move to clinician, uh, and then we'll deal with uh, the combining the two and how to move forward. So um, uh, while working on prevention, uh, uh, suicide prevention, formulating uh, this and researching uh, these constructs, uh, we formulated uh, what is now uh, what we call narrative crisis model of suicide, and although it, it's a relatively late entry into our research, it's so important going forward that, uh, and for the framework that I'm gonna be talking about, that I'm gonna describe it right now. So um, it's a simple, uh, uh, entirely empirically based um, model. It's not a, uh, that much of a theoretical construct. And uh, it's very intuitive and uh, kind of friendly. Once you hear it, I mean, you, uh, uh, probably won't be able to see suicidal behavior otherwise. So there is a long-term risk factors or chronic risk factors that we all know about uh, that uh, um, uh, impart a lifelong uh, risk for suicide. And they will know. The history, which is uh, past attempts, uh, medical history, psychiatric history, uh, impulsivity, although not as much as we would like to think, hopelessness and negative state of mind, Perfectionism, which is, by the way, uh, the most important one that we underestimate. Fearlessness, which is a trait that we underestimate also, because this is why um, military and, uh, and uh, uh, police uh, kill themselves at high rates. And as well as cultural acceptability of suicide as an option. Uh, in fact, lack of moral prohibitions against suicide. There are others. All of these uh, have empirical data uh, uh, connecting them with lifelong suicidal behavior in association, and all of them are empirically based. So when these people who are at long risk for a suicidal behavior, lifetime risk, encounter stressful life events that we, all of us encounter, and uh, 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 they could be a lot of anything, uh, uh, it could be catastrophic uh, financial losses, falling short of uh, 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 lifelong goals, romantic rejection, uh, medical illness. There's actually about seven categories that we identify. So when these specific individuals encounter those events, uh, they uh, create uh, or experience or think of a particular, develop a particular view of themselves uh, that we call suicidal narrative. And that's also a, a syndrome, uh, but it's a subacute syndrome that lasts weeks maybe months, uh, I would say on average weeks. And it's a life story uh, that uh, they see themselves in. Each of us, the narrative identity theory states, it's a relatively recent psychological theory that um, uh, you know, we, uh, people always see their life as an evolving life story uh, with the beginning, then past, 
present, future, uh, that makes sense to them. It's a coherent story. And uh, as long as the story is coherent and we, we live it, and uh, uh, then uh, we're kind of in good health. The suicidal narrative is a story that leads to no future, uh, that people uh, see themselves, uh, uh, no imaginable future. And it, uh, uh, it goes like this. There was some kind of unrealistic life goals that people set, or they think that uh, typically and uh, unrealistic objectives, such as making a first million by the age of 16, uh, or um, being uh, in a perfect relationship and uh, the perfect house and the perfect wife, as, uh, you know, as um, uh, the talking heads used to say. Uh, and uh, then something is not working out. And uh, either uh, the million is not made, or the relationship is falling apart, or they cannot get into medical school. And at that point, uh, people who are healthy are able to disengage from these unrealistic goals and re-engage with something more uh, realistic. Instead of uh, medical school, it's a nursing school. Instead of a professor, it's a teacher. Instead of a perfect relationship, imperfect relationship. But these people have a hard time doing that. And they keep pursuing the unrealistic goals, okay? Like that one and only uh, person who is incredibly, who can make you happy. And then of course they fail in achieving them. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, they perceive shattering, I mean, um, crushing defeat uh, and humiliation uh, that uh, it's very difficult to bear. It's, uh, 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 they, uh, it's so difficult uh, for them that they have a hard time connecting with others and talking to them. They uh, feel like they're burdened to other people and uh, they uh, become socially isolated because they can't talk to anybody. And uh, when they look forward, they see no acceptable future uh, that uh, uh, is not full of pain and that they cannot, they cannot look forward to. There's a perception of no future. So that is a life story. Uh, we call that suicidal narrative, and we see it again and again and again. It's subacute state last weeks. So when people uh, perceive their life as a suicidal narrative, uh, if something else happens, uh, um, like final romantic rejection, the final straw, uh, they develop a suicidal crisis. And suicide crisis syndrome uh, is an, an acute state. Uh, uh, and I'm going to describe to you what uh, the symptoms are. And that acute state lasts hours, okay? Maybe days, but hours and sometimes minutes. Uh, most of the suicides are not premeditated. Most people who die by suicide or attempt to uh, uh, have a serious suicide attempt when they woke up in the morning did not know that they're going to attempt suicide uh, uh, several hours later. So that's a very acute state. And I'm going to describe the criteria. Um, and that acute state is predictive of imminent suicidal behavior. When people experience that, okay, then uh, the risk for suicide within the first months goes up about 20, uh, 20 30 fold. So that is the model. Uh, so let's now talk about the um, suicide crisis uh, syndrome uh, that is imminent, uh, uh, connected with imminent suicidal behavior. I'm sorry. Um, before that, uh, what's the difference between narrative crisis model of suicide and others? There's some similarities because it's uh, with motivational volitional model and, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, interpersonal theory uh, because it's stress diathesis model, but there are critical differences here. First, the differences between long-term and short-term risk factors. Most importantly, it does not include suicidal ideation as a risk factor. Suicidal ideation is not part of this uh, picture at all. It's not that it doesn't appear, doesn't, is not there. It's that we cannot rely on it or use it as a, a, a foundation for our risk assessment. It may or may not be there. Some people die by suicide without ever being consciously suicidal. And I can give examples if uh, somebody wants to ask later on. And finally, uh, it is a medical theory that includes suicide crisis syndrome, which is potential uh, entity that can be treated with medications once we have. Uh, so the suicide crisis syndrome is a distinct phenotype, and this is, it is short-lived. So on the left, uh, there is a distribution of the, um, uh, of the scores of the SCS 
uh, on admission to the psychiatric unit, you see a bell-shaped curve. And then it's the same uh, people after discharge, a discharge. And as you see, the scores shifted dramatically to the lower scores because the uh, syndrome resolved with medication uh, or uh, psychotherapy or uh, uh, safety planning or whatever it may be. By comparison, uh, this is uh, anxiety scores, okay, of trait anxiety from the STI subscale. And as you see, the curve remains the same. Okay, no change. And uh, this, so this is trait anxiety. And uh, this is uh, state anxiety. Uh, uh, and as you see, there is some shift in the curve, but uh, it's much less acute uh, than suicide, the suicide crisis syndrome uh, that shifted dramatically. So the duration of suicide crisis syndrome is kind of somewhere between a panic attack and acute anxiety uh, related to a particular stress. So these are the criteria uh, for the suicide crisis syndrome. There is a one criterion A and four criteria B. Uh, and for the syndrome to be met, uh, you need to have at least one uh, symptom for each, for each of the criteria. So criterion A, which carries about the same weight as four criteria B, is um, frantic hopelessness. A shorthand would be entrapment, but frantic hopelessness is a better term. It's people who perceive, uh, uh, have a problem that they perceive as intolerable and unsolvable, and they have no exit uh, and have reached a dead end. Uh, so the death may be a, as, as the only option. Um, so the, it's a pretty un, 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 a difficult state. One of my patients uh, who dis did not disclose his suicidal intent to me uh, previously described it later on in retrospect as feeling like this. Uh, you're in a department store and uh, bustling with people, there are lights and there's life. And then the lights go off and uh, uh, you're left alone and uh, then the lights go on somewhat and uh, all the doors are locked. There's nobody there, you can't get out. You try, but you can't. So that's frantic hopelessness in state. Then there are four other uh, criteria, associated criteria. One is affective disturbance. It's an exceedingly affective state. Uh, uh, people, the most uh, prominent affective component is emotional pain. Um, which can be severe. And uh, the emotions can shift up and down dramatically as a person um, may fight uh, uh, their, their own uh, uh, emotional pain uh, and try to get out of that uh, uh, trap that they find themselves in. Uh, anxiety, critically, is extreme um, and it's accompanied by somatic symptoms that a person may not have felt before or uh, uh, like can't even describe. An acute anhedonia, that's inability to experience pleasure by people who could in the past. So that's affective disturbance. One of these must be present. Then um, the second is uh, loss of cognitive control. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, in, it is uh, ruminations about something, um, uh, about one's own distress and life events that brought it on. Um, inability to deviate from this repetitive pattern that people describe as going down the rabbit hole or being sucked into a vortex. And uh, this proliferation of sorts is such that people actually have a headache uh, or head pain um, that uh, uh, is a distinct or maybe similar to migraine. It's actually a physical state. Um, and uh, they're unable to suppress these thoughts. They keep coming back worse and worse. So that's loss of cognitive control. Uh, criterion C is disturbance in arousal. Actually, not C, but B3, we call it right now. And it's agitation, hypervigilance, irritability, and global insomnia. People feel on edge. People feel restless. They can't sleep. Uh, they snap. And hypervigilance is actually quite prominent. Uh, they are hypersensitive to sounds, noises, uh, or movements and conversations of others. And the last one is acute social withdrawal and it's uh, 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 this connection from people it's normally connected to, uh, first from the distant relations, then later uh, close and closer friends 
and uh, the communications become evasive and they don't talk about what bothers them. And so uh, that's the, uh, the syndrome. And again, there's no suicidal ideation here. The syndrome has been described and replicated now, as you will see in 15 countries, and it's the same. It's relatively invariant to cultural references, uh, 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 cultural um, and uh, racial uh, 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 criteria. The, uh, there's no suicidal ideation here, please know. And uh, if you have um, 30 seconds to ask somebody to assess suicide risk in the emergency room, you can do it with five uh, questions. The first one is, whatever brought you here, do you see a solution to this problem and exit from your, in, uh, from your dead end that you perceive yourself? If the answer is no, it's criterion A. I mean, in, in the answer is yes, the criteria A, I cannot see an exit. Second, when you think about this, is it painful? Okay, and uh, how bad is the pain? Is it an emotional pain? The third, when, when you uh, uh, think about this problem, do you have control over your thoughts or do you think the thoughts are controlling you? And that's loss of cognitive control. Fourth question, can you sleep? Uh, and you can't sleep, and it happens at night, obviously it's a problem. And finally, can you talk to somebody about this? Or did you talk to anybody about this? So that is the uh, suicide crisis syndrome uh, in a kind of abbreviated nutshell. It's a stable construct. Uh, what you see here is a network analysis. The lines indicate, um, uh, the distance between the circles is indicate how co coherent uh, the syndrome is. And the lines indicate how um, tightly various uh, uh, symptoms are connected. And as you see, it's uh, coherent because it's on one slide as opposed to outside uh, you know, the screen. Um, and uh, uh, the, what you see here is the criteria that I just described to you, four criteria and, uh, uh, and the questions uh, uh, addressing them. So um, this is a remarkable slide. Uh, it's the paper was just published. Um, and um, this is a machine learning analysis of one of our studies that uh, assessed the predictive validity uh, of um, the suicide crisis syndrome, uh, individual symptoms, individual items of suicide uh, crisis inventory scale for imminent suicidal behavior uh, within a month. And on top uh, with the arrow is you'll see two items which are, uh, exceed uh, others. I mean, it's like most predictive, the, the, obviously, the longer the item, the more weight it carries in predicting human behavior. The top one is uh, actually suicidal ideation, which is not part of the syndrome. And the second one, which is tied with it, is um, uh, anxiety and feeling strange sensations that you have in your body that you never experienced before, that carries equal predictive value for imminent suicidal behavior. And after that, uh, uh, you have uh, in the first 10 items, uh, you have uh, two or three components of each of the subcategories that I just described uh, uh, to you. So the point here is that not that suicidal ideation, it doesn't exist. It's about as important as somatic sensations in terms of predicting imminent behavior. It's just one of the uh, symptoms and nothing more. So, um, this is uh, what we call uh, uh, suicide crisis syndrome checklist. And it's a guide to an interview that would allow you to diagnose uh, the suicide crisis syndrome, or whether it's present, absent, or extreme uh, in a full form as opposed to abbreviated form that I just described to you. And that diagnosis will then allow you to make clinical decisions. It is not a risk assessment category, high, low, mid, uh, medium risk. It is the same as a diagnosis of major depressive episode, uh, yes, uh, no, mild, severe, that would allow you to make clinical decisions of what to do about the depression. Same thing. You have the syndrome, and then uh, you will have to make decisions about what to do clinically about the syndrome, which is present. It, does, it is present. So um, how, um, now that we described it, um, how, uh, uh, what, what are the parameters? What, uh, 
how does it exist in the community and in the hospital and how to use it. So uh, in the community, um, we just ran and uh, continuing uh, to run a study that we called International Suicide Prevention Assessment Research for COVID, otherwise known as ISPARC study. It's a web-based anonymous survey uh, uh, of high-risk and community participants that is now in four 14 countries and four continents uh, that assesses the intensity of suicide crisis syndrome as well as getting uh, suicidal ideation and some other information. Now, this is actually a treatment study uh, because um, the people, when they report suicide crisis syndrome or suicidal ideation, are given a list of referrals and asked if they want to use these referrals. So it's actually a treatment assessment. So a hypothesis was that suicide crisis syndrome will be prevalent with or without suicidal ideation, and it will result in self-referral for mental health services and for suicide prevention services, although people would deny suicidal ideation. And <clears throat> that um, it will be higher for internal entrapment, uh, interpersonal factors, as opposed to external entrapment, such as uh, lockdowns or uh, you know, working from home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is the study design. People would consent, and then they would see demographics. Um, and a lot of people would, uh, kind of may drop out at that point. Um, although the study is actually anonymous, there's no way we can track people who participate in it. It's pretty long and uh, you know some people get spooked by the demographics. Then uh, you have COVID-related changes, battery, stress life events, questionnaire, the suicide crisis inventory, uh, Columbia suicide severity rating, scale screener, which was suicide ideation, and uh, then narrative inventory and treatment utilization. So this is the analysis from about a month ago. Um, and uh, so uh, in 14 countries, we had 36,000 people who started participation and 16,000 people who completed. And it ranged from um, 4,700 in Taiwan to I think 75 in Pakistan, although I think now it's more than, uh, more than 100. And um, there's a couple of, we're analyzing the data, there's six or seven papers that are being written right now, uh, both internationally and locally. And several interesting things came up in the first analysis. So this is the prevalence of the syndrome. And uh, it, range, it ranges from 3.6% in Israel uh, to uh, what would be 16.2% in Poland. Now, this is somewhat a convenient sample. So uh, uh, some populations may be more community, some populations can be more clinical. But in either case, what's uh, uh, clear is that the prevalence of suicidal crisis syndrome is actually lower than suicidal ideation. If you remember, uh, it was in the newspapers, at the moment, 25 to 50% of uh, young Americans experience suicidal ideation. Okay. This is about four times, three, four times lower than that. So it's more, uh, it's actually more acute symptom. Now, this is a, a remarkable, uh, let me go through this slide. So this is a correlation between stressful life events that we're gonna go in a minute to what they were and the uh, uh, prevalence of suicide crisis syndrome. Uh, and, uh, it turns out the stressful life events are more connected and a lot more connected with suicide crisis syndrome than with suicidal ideation, and sometimes completely unrelated to suicidal ideation. So the yellow highlights, as you see the odds ratio of uh, this correlation coefficient, and you see it's between uh, 0.41 and 0.51. And this 95% confidence interval. And this one uh, for suicidal ideation between 0.14 and 0.22. There is not overlap between the two intervals, not even close. In fact, the difference is about fourfold. Uh, uh, the association between uh, stressful life events and suicide crisis syndrome is four times stronger than with suicidal ideation. And moreover, now you can see here, it's universal in every single country and significant. While the association with suicidal ideation is sporadic, and in some countries it's actually absent, uh, and in some countries actually negative, 
uh, and uh, uh, overall uh, uh, is uh, nowhere near as reliable or strong as the suicide crisis center. Now, why is it? Uh -huh. So this is just uh, confirms what I said. This is universal association, and this is sporadic. Now, uh, so which uh, uh, stressful life events are related? And the first is um, how related, uh, and you see four groups of participants, and uh, one group is on the left is no suicide radiation, no syndrome. This is suicide crisis syndrome. This is suicide radiation. This is the combination. And as you see, the relationship is the strongest with the combination, followed by suicide crisis syndrome, and uh, the lowest is suicide radiation or not, and they're actually quite similar. And of the possible stressful life events, it is relationship stressors and threats to the identity that are related here, 0.01, and not threat to harm and not threats to personal safety, and I would add not uh, um, uh, lockdowns or any of these particular uh, uh, COVID-related events. And this is who seeks, seeks treatment uh, in pandemic, uh, and those who want to uh, utilize mental health and suicide prevention resources during COVID-19. And again, uh, this is percentage of participants planning to utilize the resources. And you see that the lowest one, people who have nothing, but there's still some, still 13%. Uh, uh, would uh, look suicide, uh, uh, actually explore suicide prevention resources. SI is slightly higher, suicide crisis syndrome double, and the combination is triple. So the highest risk, uh, uh, the highest people who want uh, suicide prevention resources most are those who have both suicide crisis syndrome and suicidal ideation. Um, so uh, the, uh, we reanalyze the data because we realized that after looking at this, we don't know why people look for uh, suicide prevention resources, whether it's for themselves, for friends, for general information. Uh, and it turns out uh, that for suicide crisis syndrome, uh, people look for themselves. Uh, for the suicidal ideation, they look for friends, uh, help with friends because they don't know what suicide crisis syndrome is in France and people do not report it, but they hear suicidal ideation and they can get worried. Um, so uh, if, uh, the, the bias even more so in favor of looking for suicide crisis syndrome. So this data is being analyzed and we're continuing, um, but we have actually a couple of interesting things for inpatient use of suicide crisis syndrome. So uh, there are two uh, uh, hospitals systems that we dealt with. Uh, one is in Bergen University Hospital, Norway. Uh, and uh, they have an ongoing study uh, that uh, associates various, it's kind of almost machine learning study of, in uh, medical records, uh, uh, trying to predict the imminent suicidal behavior. And what they try to contrast is the acute syndrome, acute dysphoria, similar to panic attacks, uh, and diagnosis of um, uh, major depressive disorder or suicidal ideation. What would be predictable of what? And the second is North Shore Health System in Chicago, Illinois, then unbeknownst to us, to us implemented a short version of the um, suicide crisis syndrome checklist that I described to you, six questions. So let's see actually what happened. So this is uh, Bergen data. Uh, HONOS is a question about acute distress uh, and a discharge. And uh, what's interesting is that then they actually, these are completed suicides, not attempts. This is the only data that we have on completed suicides. In people who were in acute distress, okay, were at very high risk to attempt suicide within seven days of discharge. And there was no relationship between past suicide attempts and a much smaller, or weaker, weaker relationship with suicidal ideation, not significant. However, uh, suicidal ideation was associated uh, with suicide, uh, suicide, completed suicide within six months to 12 months. Um, so again, suicidal ideation is not a marker for imminent, uh, imminent risk uh, and acute distress is. So um, now North Shore. This is the abbreviated screen that they implemented in EPIC and now they used for 18 months. 
And uh, it has two steps. One is uh, a question about uh, criterion A and criterion B2. Do you feel trapped uh, with no options left, which is criterion A? And two, are you overwhelmed and have you lost control of negative thoughts filling your head, which is criterion B1? If somebody says yes, then they do the rest of the assessment. And it's not a check. Uh, it's actually a checklist at the end, but it's conversational intent. And uh, then the clinician judges will they have affective disturbance, loss of control, social withdrawal, um, and disturbance in arousal. And at the end, uh, they interpret and give a diagnosis, yes, no, or extreme. And then uh, they uh, use that information how they see fit, okay, in their clinical check. So this is a slide of what happened uh, in the emergency room uh, uh, after the, uh, this uh, assessment was implemented. So uh, you see uh, pre-mid implementation uh, uh, variables in the left and post-implementation variables in the right. And as you see, all uh, items are significant, different significant in every, every way. But if you dig into it, that's what's interesting. So the initial admissions rate has changed in that more people were admitted at their first visit for the emergency, to the emergency room, first ever. Uh, that makes sense because uh, now people with suicide crisis syndrome without suicide radiation were admitted. However, the rate of readmissions went down uh, by, uh, uh, actually it's not clearly seen here, from 25% uh, to 13%, it's 40% uh, drop. So uh, uh, people were treated on the first time and were not, uh, were not readmitted the second time. Uh, the data is not here because uh, uh, the N is too small, but there was no suicides and there was no serious suicide attempts in 18 months in the system that required um, uh, root cause analysis. Before uh, the implementation of suicide crisis syndrome, 70 59% uh, of 0.8% uh, of people were discharged with suicide radiation, more than half. And that changed to 44%. Actually, before the implementation of SES, having suicide radiation was uh, uh, associated with discharge, not admission. Uh, and that changed with uh, the SES implementation. And uh, uh, the same thing uh, uh, happened uh, with people who were admitted uh, uh, with SI, the whole pattern has changed. So what actually changed? Uh, what changed is the concordance of clinical decision-making uh, with the diagnosis of suicide crisis syndrome versus uh, having suicidal ideation. Meaning uh, the concordance means that people who had the syndrome were dis uh, uh, admitted and people who didn't have it were, were discharged. And as you see, the clinician's decision-making and this is from EPIC data, was 90% considered uh, consistent with the diagnosis, 95% in this particular case. And as you see on the right, uh, uh, suicidal ideation had very little to do with clinical decision making. And then we uh, repeated this, uh, this in a larger sample, and the data is more or less the same. Uh, so 8% of people, this is for the discharge data, uh, who had the syndrome were discharged and 92% were admitted. And 44% uh, 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 of people with suicidal ideation were discharged. So clinicians entirely shift the decision-making uh, to the presence or absence of uh, suicide crisis syndrome. Okay, let me take a, a, a kind of a deep breath here and switch gears from what's happening in the clinician's, uh, in the patient's mind, which is the suicide crisis syndrome, to what's happening in clinician's mind. And those strange uh, uh, you know, feelings that people may have had um, uh, that, uh, that they knew that they couldn't identify. So um, we did the following uh, 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 kind of analysis. Uh, uh, when a patient comes into the, uh, the, uh, your clinician's office uh, and patient is suicidal, they feel all these things that the suicide crisis syndrome have, and it's entrapment or uh, um, frantic hopelessness, emotional pain, ruminative flooding, and it's a terrible, terrible state. 
and uh, they're full of negative emotion. And on the right, there's a clinician that in their perception has no emotion. The clinician is just there to put a blue balm of happiness on them. Obviously, that's not how that works. There is a lot of data that, in fact, clinicians, when they deal with suicidal patients, have a lot of negative emotion. And it's anxiety, uh, uh, discomfort, distress, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there are two types of feelings that clinicians have. Typically, I, I'm not going to go into detail of this because um, uh, uh, the, uh, we don't have time. But uh, the, uh, some emotions, particularly initially, are positive. When a clinician feels hopeful, the patient idealizes the clinician, and the clinician gets all involved and all invested uh, in, uh, in saving the patient. And when that does not happen, the patient remains suicidal, then uh, the uh, clinician can become actually angry, distressed, and may dread seeing the patient. Uh, we analyzed these feelings okay, in several papers and identified three emotions uh, in clinician which are associated with increased suicide risk for the patient in the imminent future. Uh, immediate future. The first one is just plain distress, distress response. If the clinician is distressed, if patient make, makes clinician feel distressed, regardless of what's going on, uh, the suicide risk needs to be adjusted to higher from uh, having no distress. And uh, that's a simple emotion. And there are two more complex emotion, which, emotions which are associated with increased suicide uh, risk in the future by the patient. One is anxious over-involvement, which is a combination of hope and distress. If you think it's a paradoxical emotion, uh, because um, if you're hopeful for the patient, what makes you uh, uh, distressed? So we call this anxious over involvement, uh, kind of related to counter-transference kind of love for those who are analytically inclined. And the other paradoxical emotion is hopelessness and calm. And it means you hope, feel hopeless about the patient that nothing can be done but yet it doesn't distress you. You feel calm and resigned that the patient is going to die no matter what you're going to do. And that's distancing on denial. So these three emotions measured by uh, what we call uh, um, therapist uh, uh, response questionnaire, short form, uh, 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 actually predictive of imminent behavior um, to uh, a lesser degree than suicide crisis syndrome, but in the same bulk. So um, <clears throat> how do we put it together? Um, well, we did several studies and uh, this study was on 452 patients uh, uh, and 59 clinicians. And this is the study that clinicians participated in um, uh, and they rep reported their emotions uh, with regard to their patients. And people were admitted uh, with suicidal attempts or suicidal ideation. There were moderate risk for suicide. It was an outpatient study. And they were evaluated and then reached 70% uh, uh, of the subjects were reached for one month's follow up. Seven attempted suicide. And so when you put it together, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go direction. Um, sorry. So um, uh, the, uh, the study was called Mary study. Modular assessment of risk for imminent suicide. And uh, when we finished the study, <clears throat> only the two scales were predictive of imminent behavior. One was the patient model scale, which is suicide crisis uh, 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 inventory short form, 10 questions. And the other one is clinician model, also 10 questions. The scales that uh, take one, minute, uh, one to two minutes to administer. And so now when you look at the data, the suicide crisis syndrome was predictive of behavior attempt within one month <clears throat> with a um, uh, odds ratio of about 5.5. The clinician's emotions were predictive of suicidal behavior with about the same, but having either or had a 16-fold uh, uh, odds ratio for predicting imminent behavior, but not uh, both. It's either or, important. Um, the, uh, this is a um, set person's scale modified, 
unrelated, state anxiety of admission unrelated, peak lifetime suicidal ideation related because people are more honest about disclosing it, past month suicidal ideation unrelated. However, both suicide crisis syndrome and uh, emotional responses are related. Um, so then the question is, uh, why is that there was no relationship between suicide crisis syndrome and emotional responses? Shouldn't we uh, be worried? Shouldn't we get upset uh, when uh, the patient has the suicide crisis syndrome? So what are we responding to? Because certainly not to that. Uh, and uh, so we use the narrative uh, crisis model to understand what we respond emotionally to, we clinicians. And so we tested the, the association between uh, long-term factors, trait vulnerability, suicidal narrative, and suicidal crisis syndrome. And what we discovered, skip that, is that the association was with suicide, the suicidal narrative, not the syndrome. And if you remember, suicidal narrative is a life story. It's a story of a person uh, trying to achieve something and then falling short and able to disengage, can't connect and having no future. So we as human beings, we respond to people's stories we, uh, and we don't respond to the checklist. And that's critical because with the checklist, uh, uh, electronic medical records, okay, we distract ourselves from the stories. And we lose a lot of information and uh, 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 that would allow us to identify those who are actually at risk. A lot of information that we would put in our clinical judgment. And uh, what we do is we basically <coughs> assess on a scale from one to 10, how likely somebody is to attempt suicide and then we act, whether to admit, discharge, medicate, not medicate. And that, so that's clinical judgment. Just to uh, kind of uh, dot the eyes, what goes into other clinical judgment? Into other clinical judgment. So one is rational thinking, history, mental status examination, uh, uh, intensity suicide crisis syndrome, another one, emotional response, which is a gut feeling. And uh, the uh, reality is that neither of them is directly related, as you see here, uh, to patient suicidal behavior. But when we process, when mediated by our judgment, both of them are strongly related to patient suicidal behavior in ways we do not necessarily understand, but um, the indirect effect is very strong uh, and similar between uh, standard tricks, uh, between the rational factors, standard risk scales, and clinicians' emotional response. So um, I'm running out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to talk about how the model is proven. But in your risk assessment, and that's the last thing I'm going to, uh, to say before I skip forward to one other slide, is that you start with the most acute uh, uh, factor, suicide crisis syndrome, no suicidal ideation. Then you go to assess suicidal narrative. After that, you assess stress trait vulnerability. After that, you already form your opinion. Okay. And after that, you assess, uh, ask about suicidal ideation, which is kind of a modifier. Uh, and then you factor in your emotional response. This is the assessment. So when somebody tells you uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, I am, uh, you know, I failed in becoming an English professor. My parents uh, tell me that I'm a loser. I'm living with them, I'm a burden of them. Okay, I, uh, I don't know what's gonna happen to me because I cannot be a teacher, it's gonna be a failure. But I'm not gonna kill myself because I'm not gonna do it to my family, you would tell, you would take the latest statement with a grain of salt, although it's explicit denial. So the last thing, uh, forgive me if I'm making you dizzy with this, this is the proof that the model works. And um, uh, the last is this. Narrative model, uh, crisis model of suicide actually can be used as a comprehensive uh, guide to uh, risk assessment, I mean, to uh, suicide prevention. And then you start from the right, right, the most acute thing, and go left. So if somebody is on, has a gun in their hands, the most important thing is means restriction. Take the gun out of their hands. After that, the person has suicide crisis syndrome, and we postulate that you cannot 
do psychotherapy with a person who is having suicide crisis syndrome. It's like trying to uh, therapize somebody who is in acute pain. You have to treat the syndrome and it's treatable. Uh, once you treat the syndrome and the emotional pain is reduced, then you can use CAMS, ACIP, and other psychotherapeutic method uh, to restructure uh, a suicidal narrative and, uh, and make it less uh, painful. Then you have time and uh, you know, room uh, to improve the stress management techniques, and then you can use long-term ter therapy to uh, deal with uh, long-term risk factors, such as protections. So this is currently in press, uh, and hopefully it's going to uh, come out soon. And I'll probably end here uh, after uh, just saying that most of it is in the book. Here is the first edition. Uh, the second edition is in the works. Uh, so it's on Amazon. And uh, thank you for your attention. Stop sharing. Thank you so much. And uh, there are a number of questions that uh, we won't probably be able to get to all of them. Um, but um, just to start with the, the first one that came in, um, could you share an example of somebody who died by suicide without ever having conscious thoughts? Um, you mentioned that early on in the talk. There's other questions that maybe we can follow up on later, but maybe sure. if you could just try it, try it that one in the next minute or two. It's somebody who didn't die by suicide because who she did was, who did die by suicide oh, but without conscious not. thoughts yeah i wouldn't have okay then i wouldn't be able to assess what i can tell you is a person who nearly died by suicide without having conscious thought so a woman uh is working in it uh and is going through divorce has a child okay uh, and uh has very difficult time with the divorce she's uh she's uh, distressed and distracted. Her boss calls on the, uh, on the floor and says, look, unless you shape up, you're fine. And which will obviously, uh, in this case, uh, uh, she will lose the child because she cannot support the child. So what she does uh, is that she runs to work every morning uh, after taking the child to school, then go, runs back home, takes care of the child who's like 12, and then runs back to work, I mean, to finish what she was doing, leaving the child alone. And uh, one day, uh, while running uh, across the street to work, what would be Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, uh, she sees the upcoming van coming up and stops. The van hits her, okay, and she breaks pelvis uh, and hip and bone, and you know, she makes it. And then, uh, you know, comes to me for the assessment, uh, and uh, I asked if she planned to kill herself, said, no, I didn't. But in retrospect, I did. Because why did I stop? That's the example. Thank you very much. There's you really stimulated a, a lot of questions, which we'll uh, maybe we'll follow up on and and and, and can pass along. And I know that there was uh, so much uh, relevant here for for us um, individually as as clinicians and researchers, and also for our services. So. Um, thank you, thank you again for uh, for participating, and thanks to everybody who um, who signed in. There is a link to the evaluation. Um, no, those are really important. Those are used uh, to uh, to help un understand what people are interested in. So please complete that evaluation, and um, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Apologies for not leaving room for questions. It's okay. Take care. Bye.